Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to the BC Wheelchair Sports Show. Today, I'm joined by an athlete um, from Ontario who's currently just out here doing some prep for the upcoming Paralympic Games. Uh, it's wheelchair tennis athlete Rob Shaw. He's a Parapan Am Games gold medalist, um, and he's looking to make history for Canada in Tokyo uh, later this year. How are you doing today, Rob? Hey, Nathan, thanks for that intro. Yeah, doing well. It's another beautiful sunny day in Kelowna, so uh, not much to complain about over here. All right, so I always start these episodes off by just asking um, everybody how you first got involved um, in adaptive sports or in wheelchair tennis. Yeah, so for me, that's a fairly long story, but I'll keep it relatively brief if I can. Um, I grew up playing uh, stand-up tennis, and by the time I was 14 or 15, I started coaching um, at a, a local club back in North Bay, Ontario. And by the time I was 18, we started to offer some wheelchair tennis programming ourselves as coaches. So for about two or three years, we ran some wheelchair tennis programming. Um, so when I had my injury at 21, I was already fairly familiar with the sport. I had coached it for a few years at a recreational level, but I knew I'd be able to play it if I wanted to. And so right from the hospital, I got linked up with a, a gentleman named Gary Luker, who was my sport mentor at the time. And um, yeah, he brought me out on the courts, showed me the ropes, taught me how to tape my hand to the racket. And uh, I've been playing ever since. So it was a funny transition going from the stand-up game to the wheelchair and from coach to athlete. But uh, we transitioned it pretty well, I think, over the last couple of years. Yeah. And now you brought up that transition, you know, from the stand-up game to the wheelchair game. What did you find were the, I guess, the easiest parts of that transition, but also the most challenging parts as far as figuring out the sport? Because obviously wheelchair tennis and able-bodied or, or stand-up tennis are quite similar, um, but there are some differences. Yeah, I think the easiest thing for me to learn was um, just the, 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 the technique of certain strokes. Um, having that coaching background, there was, you know, a few strokes that are pretty unique to the wheelchair game, like the inverted backhand. Uh, and then with me taping my hand to the racket, obviously all my strokes have to do with one grip, which changes the racket face at contact and, and your preparation for the swing. So being a coach, I knew how to navigate that on my own and didn't really need a lot of technical help from another coach, um, which was really helpful. I could just go up on the court with my brothers and they'd feed me balls and I'd be able to work on my own development that way. Um, Hardest thing for sure was just letting the ego uh, go, right? Let, let, letting go of that stand-up player, not reflecting back on how much better I was as a stand-up player, how much easier it was to move. Uh, oh, you know, this shot, I'd be able to hit no problem, you know, three years ago, and now I can't hit it. And letting that go and not worrying about what other people were thinking or what, you're, what I was thinking about myself, I think, took a few years for me. Uh, and even now and then, I still get caught up in that um, but I'm able to release it a lot faster now which is great yeah and I think that's really important you know the the mental side of sport and it's something that often gets forgotten and I think there's an added layer to that sometimes in parasport um, especially if you're coming from a different sport background or if you're coming from um, having a certain level of function before and then adapting later on um, there can be a couple you know small hurdles there so I'm glad to hear that you've you know been working on that and finding ways through it. Um, it's always great. And now one of the other things you mentioned um, just in, in the previous answers is you mentioned having to, to tape the racket um, to your hand. Can you explain a bit about how um, that process works and why you might have to do that for anybody who uh, might be a little confused when you, you mentioned taping it to yourself? Yeah, totally. So in, in wheelchair tennis, we have three divisions. We have the men's division, the women's division, and then what's called the quad division. So I belong to the quad division and in the quad division, you have players that have an array of different disabilities and function levels, but typically you have individuals who have impairments to at least three or more limbs. Um, so someone like for me, for example, I have a spinal cord injury at C5, C6. So my legs are partially paralyzed and then my hands and my arms are partially paralyzed as well. Um, so my hitting hand, my right hand, I can only close it this much. I can't close any more than that. And so holding a tennis racket for me would be impossible without some form of um, adhesive component there. So for me, I use tape. I find that it gives me a little bit of flexibility to still feel the racket and um, manipulate the grip a little bit. Um, and it's easy to put on. So I actually use hockey tape that I put over my hand and around the racket. And then I use reverse duct tape to add a little stickiness to it. 
so that when I'm pushing the push rim for movement, I have a little bit of tack there. Um, and other players on the tour will use different things like prosthetics to attach their hand to the racket. Um, other guys will use like medical tape. So it's fairly common. It's just everyone has to find a, a, a style or a situation that, that works best for them. Nice. And you've been pretty active on the tour almost since getting right into the sport. So what have your experience, for, and for those of you who don't know, uh, wheelchair tennis uh, has a international tennis tour that's run by the International Tennis Federation. And it's actually, I believe it's, it's still called the Uniqlo ITF wheelchair tennis tour. Um, but what have some of your experiences been like um, traveling around the world and, and playing in tournaments? Yeah, we're super blessed as tennis players in that sense, Nathan, where we do have the professional tour. Uh, we are paid athletes. If you perform well at tournaments, you, you do win prize money. So, you know, it does give you that incentive to compete full time and to train because you can make a living doing it if you get up to a, a certain level. So it, for me, it's afforded me the ability to see the world um, to a certain extent. Obviously, certain countries, I only get to see really the tennis course in the airports. Um, but there are other ones where I do get to travel a little bit, which is kind of nice and meet new people from different backgrounds and, and learn how other people have managed to um, cope and thrive and adapt with their own disabilities within their own settings, which is always, always, I think, a good learning tool for, for us individuals with disabilities is learning how other people do things a bit differently and learning about their circumstances. So like I said, we're super blessed to have that tour. Um, you can compete really in as many tournaments as you want, as long as you can afford to do so. And um, it is taxing traveling that much, but also just really enjoyable and, and really just a fortunate thing we're able to do. Yeah. And for, for you personally as an athlete, you've had a, a really strong, I guess, past, I want to say maybe three, four years where you've been just steadily rising up the ranks. You've kind of broke, established yourself now pretty clearly in the top 15, potentially in the top 10 of the quad division. Um, what has that meant for you to, to be kind of on the precipice of, the highest point of your sport? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting. I think it just shows that the work we're putting in, both on court, off court, um, the work we put in with the sports psychologist is starting to reap some rewards, I would say. Um, still have a hard time sometimes thinking about myself that way, that I am top 10 and, uh, you know, up in that upper echelon of players. Because when I go and compete, I just feel like I'm still just playing tennis. Uh, you know, I try not to worry so much about where I'm ranked or, or the, the size of the tournament or the meaning yeah. of the tournament. Um, but yeah, I think now when I do go to tournaments and I see players that are ranked below me or ones who are just coming up, I can reflect back when I used to be uh, in those positions when I was just starting out. And that is what triggers me to think, oh yeah, I've come a long way. I'm definitely a lot better player than I was eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, but in the moment, sometimes it's hard to remember that. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's funny when you get those moments of perspective. And I, I think it's, it's a kind of universal thread for a lot of athletes I've been talking to, um, especially the ones that are, you know, really excellent or at that really high performance level like you are. Uh, when you're like, what does it mean when you hit this point? And they're like, well, I never really realized it until I took a step back. Um, and obviously in, in this year of all years, you've probably had plenty of time to kind of take a step back and reflect on things and, put things in a perspective. So going off of that, um, being in this, this wild, challenging COVID year that we're in, how have you found um, preparing for a Paralympic Games during this situation? Yeah, definitely unique, but it was going to be unique for me no matter what. It's my first Games experience. So no matter what, the preparation was going to be unique and novel. Um, obviously, not having access to competition is a little unfortunate leading up into it. Um, that's sort of the, I think the biggest thing that we're missing is just that competitive feel and, and also the traveling that goes along with it. Um, you know, I've been, I've been out of the travel mentality for almost a year and a half now, whereas before I was fully immersed in it for almost four years where you sort of live out of a suitcase and never home for more than seven to 10 days at a time before you're jumping off somewhere else for either training or competition. So it's been strange to be in one spot for so long. Um, fortunately we've, we've got some, uh, some great funding from places like National Bank and On the Podium and Tennis Canada and Quest for Gold to help me set up a bit of a home gym here. So I'm able to stay in shape and stay fit that way. But yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. You know, I think we, uh, 
uh, as we get better as a society, as far as like, you know, getting our vaccines and keeping our social distancing, things are starting to open up now, which is nice. So hopefully going down to Vancouver will help with the training to play against some, some other wheelchair players. But for now, it's just a lot of, a lot of repetition on court, which, uh, is a little bit unique for us. We're used to doing more match play com- combined with uh, repetition. So, and I know right before we started this, and even from that last answer, you did talk about missing competition and how important that was. And and one of the last major competitions you competed in um, before all this shut down was a really historic one. You actually you won Canada's first ever gold medal in wheelchair tennis um, at the Parapan M Games in Lima. Um, and for a lot of people who don't who might not be familiar with wheelchair tennis or don't follow a pair sport. That really was uh, an incredible and historic accomplishment. Um, what was it like for you to compete there? Obviously your first multi-sport games um, and be able to, to, to win the whole thing. Yeah, it was an interesting tournament because obviously it was the pair of Pan Am games, which is a, you know, only happens every four years and it's a multi-sport games. And for me, it was my first multi-sport game experience, but it was also part of our qualification process for Tokyo uh, in a sense that our top seven uh, tournament results during the months of June 2019 to uh, June 2020 counted towards Tokyo qualification. So we didn't really go into that tournament thinking about it as a, a big uh, multi-sport game opportunity. We just thought about it as another tournament that I have to play well in to secure my spot at Tokyo. So going through that tournament, it felt like a very normal tournament to me. Obviously, we had way more fans than normal, um, which was kind of cool to play in front of. But after winning, we didn't really celebrate that much. Obviously, there was a a bit of a media whirlwind afterwards, but I was immediately on a plane the next day flying to Toronto, where I competed three days later in another tournament. And I flew away from Toronto to St. Louis, where I competed there, then St. Louis to South Carolina, where I competed there and then South Carolina to Brazil. So it was one after another after another. So I didn't really have time to enjoy the, the moment or celebrate that, that aggressively because uh, there was still work to be done. Yeah. Um, afterwards, I got to reflect back and I thought, oh, it was pretty cool to be able to perform that well on that big of a stage. But at the time, it didn't feel like a big stage because we were just treating it like uh, another tournament that needed to be, be won. So. Just another piece of the puzzle. And... Mm-hmm. I find there it's really interesting when you bring up your schedule, you know, going from one competition to another. And and I assume almost all of those competitions were probably fairly high level with, with really difficult draws and you don't have too much of a break between. And, and what I think is really important that people remember is that athletes are more than just athletes. And in your case, not only are, are, were you, or are you a high performance athlete, but you're also managing you know, life as a PhD student. So how do you find um, that work-life balance or work or athlete student balance um, in your life, especially when you're traveling so much? Yeah, it definitely was taxing. Um, I'm I'm very happy that I I finished my schooling last week, I think. So um, now going forward, I'm able to just compete as an athlete and not have that sort of stress going on behind the scenes because it was very unique going to tournaments and competing, um, you know, going to the courts from let's say seven in the morning until three or four in the afternoon, and then not being able to come back to the hotel room and just relax uh, and recover. I had to, I had to work. Um, you know, I had to do, you know, either reading or writing or, or um, respond to emails or engage in meetings. So there was always something to be done. And it was something that my supervisor at the time was in full support of, which was amazing. I, I wouldn't be able to do it without her support. But it was tiring. Yeah, it was really tiring. And that probably added into the um, inability to celebrate some of the bigger moments was because there was always something else going on behind the scenes that I couldn't really take two or three days off to just relax because, you know, I had these other obligations to uh, to uh, to do. So unique, not something that um, I thought I would end up doing, combining the two together like that. But it's worked out well for me. Uh, but I am happy to have a bit of a break from the, the double life for the next couple of months. And if I'm not mistaken, some of your research uh, was actually around the notion of mentorship. Am I correct there? Yeah, you are. Totally. Yeah. And so that's something that especially in in our world, in the, in the parasport world, in the wheelchair tennis world is a, a really big component as well with people sharing tips with each other 
whether it's things for on court or whether it's things for off court, how to manage um, some of their day to day tasks. And I know um, since, while you've been in uh, Kelowna, one of the things you've done a few times is dropped in on the the junior wheelchair tennis program there and been a mentor to some of those young kids that are coming up. What has that experience been like for you? And um, why do you think it's important for athletes to give back? Yeah, I love our little program that we have run out here. Uh, Ava's doing an amazing job of recruiting and, um, and adhering those people to that program. She's done a great job of making it fun, making it accessible. Uh, we have, you know, between, usually five to eight players coming out every single week. Um, I try making it whenever I can during the winter months, it was easier because getting court time here was challenging. Now that I can get court time and I'm, you know, full, full on in training mode, I'm only out there maybe every second week, but I just think it's so important to show the younger generation just what, um, what they're capable of doing and uh, sort of normalizing uh, community participation. Right. It's not like these events are being held at some sort of private clinic away from society out on a hill or in the country. Uh, you know, they're right in the heart of Kelowna, where there's other able body stand up programs going on. So you're fully getting that experience of playing a sport where right beside you is another program going on teaching stand up tennis. So it sort of normalizes the experience of just engaging in sport in society, um, which then allows some of these some of these uh, young kids to gain the confidence to then join a, a stand-up program and not have to just join a accessibility program or a disability specific program. So there's been two or three athletes now who have um, joined a stand-up program. So they're meeting new people, meeting new friends. And that's what it's all about, right? Is socializing and just uh, meeting new people and allowing them to, to thrive uh, within society. So it's been super fun. I know how important mentorship is from a a day-to-day -day, uh, life situation and also from a sports situation uh, perspective. So super happy to be part of that program. Awesome. Um, yeah. And I, I guess we'll, we'll kind of sort back to sport here and then this will probably be my last serious question of the interview. Um, so you're active in the quad division, uh, which is, is really starting to grow. It's now finally in all of the grand slams. Um, is there anything that you would like to see for the future of um, quad division tennis, uh, whether that's in terms of profile or, or just in terms of some general things in the division? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think like in any para sport, there's classification issues across the board. Um, tennis is not, uh, is not, um, unique in that fact. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we experienced that as well. I don't have as big of an issue with classification in my division as some athletes, um, I'm more under the, uh, the perspective that everyone's different. Some people are going to naturally have an advantage over others. That's not a disability specific, uh, perception. That's a life perception. So, or perspective, I should say. So I think going forward, I would just like to see the quad division get a little bit more respect. Like you said, at the, at the grand slams, we're finally able to compete at all four grand slams, but our draw sizes are smaller. Um, and I think that our top 10 is just as competitive now within the division as the men's and the women's who have eight draws. Yep. So I think going forward, we're starting to see that shift. The Australian Open had an eight draw. Um, I think some of the other tournaments are having conversations about having eight draws as well. Um, so that's what I would like to see is just the quad division getting a little bit more respect on those bigger stages. But I think as far as classification goes, there's only so much you can do. We don't, we don't want to become a sport that has... 10 different divisions. Yeah. The athletes don't want that. Uh, the coaches don't want that. And the ITF doesn't want that. So we need to find some sort of a middle ground, but, um, right now I'd rather be, you know, ranked number nine or eight in the world in my division than number one in the world in a division with only two people. Yeah. Um, so that's the way I've always looked at it, but certainly getting a little more, a little more respect on the tour as a division would be, would be nice going forward. Awesome. And where would you like to see the sport grow in Canada? Um, or what would you like more people to know about wheelchair tennis? Yeah, I think we're doing a pretty good job of growing it at more of a grassroots to recreation level. Um, it's just hard to transition from recreation into competitive because there is no real feeder program in Canada. And because it's such a big country, um, it's hard to find 
you know, you know, those, those hubs where you have lots of athletes coming together to, to compete, yeah. um, you know, some, some new player uh, up in salmon arm might be the only wheelchair player there. And for them to go get competition, they may have to travel an hour and a half to Kamloops or an hour, two hours down to Kelowna, yeah. which makes it really challenging to take that next step. Um, so I would say like wheelchair tennis is one of the most um, adaptable sports in a sense that I, I train with stand-up players and I, it was stand-up players mainly. So I think as like a country or as a country full of tennis players, just making yourself accessible to people with, uh, with, with disabilities who are playing wheelchair tennis, you know, inviting them out for hits, um, giving them uh, the opportunity to just engage within the club because you can, you know, improve your skills that way. Harder to improve competing against other wheelchair players, but competing within a club system um, and competing as other stand-up players is one way that you can progress out of that recreational phase into that more competitive phase. So I think clubs just opening up, being more accessible, realizing that the sport can be played by people in, in, in wheelchairs and making your clubhouses accessible, making the courts accessible is a, a, a big step that we can do to facilitate some more participation. Awesome. And um, now we'll just go into some fun stuff to finish things up here. So um, what's your favorite surface to play on? I love playing on clay courts. I'm not a very good pusher on tour. I'm one of the slowest guys out there. Um, but I do hit with some pretty heavy topspin. So the clay reacts nicely with my style of play um, that uh, I've had some good success on that surface. Nice. Okay. And who's your favorite uh, player to play against or hit with? Oof. Favorite player to um, hit with is definitely, I would say Heath Davidson out of Australia. He's just a super fun guy. He's also an incredible tennis player, but he's just such a, a jovial guy that uh, practicing with him has always been fun at tournaments. Um, favorite guy to compete against. Um, I would probably say uh, this Brazilian fellow, uh, Manny Silva. We just have really good matches against each other. He's um, a doubles partner that I often play with on tour, but he also brings out a really uh, competitive edge in me uh, when I'm playing him. I think I do the same for him as well. So really nice guy, also super humble, but uh, yeah, he seems to bring out the best in me whenever I play him. And do you just, okay, so that pretty much finishes up all of my questions. Um, so now if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, whether it's about you, whether it's about wheelchair tennis, um, or just something you'd like to let people know, this is your time to do so. Yeah, I think I'll just reiterate what I said a few moments ago, that if you are a, a stand-up tennis player or you belong to a club, just do your best to make it as accessible as possible. Um, you know, I belong to a club here, the Mission Tennis Club in Kelowna, and, um, you know, they've identified some accessibility issues with their club. And now they're going forward to uh, make those changes. And that obviously will help me as an athlete, but it's going to help out, uh, help out everyone. It'll help out new players coming into the game. It'll help out uh, seniors that might have uh, issues with mobility. So I think just making sure that the actual access to facilities are as accessible as we possibly can is a really big step that we can do fairly easily, I think, as, as community members going forward. Awesome. Yeah. And there are plenty of resources um, for clubs who are looking to become more accessible or more inclusive of wheelchair tennis and other adaptive forms of the game. Um, for more information on that, you can always reach out to Tennis Canada. Now, if you're listening to this show or watching this episode and you're interested in getting involved in wheelchair tennis, um, you can always reach out to us, our program manager for wheelchair tennis, uh, is Michelle McDonnell, and she's accessible at Michelle at bcwheelchersports.com. If, like Rob, um, you're from Ontario and you're looking to get involved out there, um, definitely get in touch with the Ontario Para Network. Uh, we'll include their website and our links on our episode page for this, um, so you can learn how to get involved there. If you're from anywhere else in Canada, um, definitely reach out to Tennis Canada, and they'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Um, thank you, Rob, for joining me. I really appreciate uh, you giving me some of your time. And yeah, best of luck in Tokyo going forward. We can't wait to cheer you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nathan. And good luck with the rest of the episodes. Thanks.